Okay, I think we can begin. Um, welcome everybody to a new origin seminar. I hope everybody had a good uh, Thanksgiving's break, especially after all the deadlines that were uh, there last week. Today we're having a talk from John Zink, who did his bachelor, his undergrad at the University of California in Los Angeles, moved to the California State University at Northridge for his master's and is back again uh, in Los Angeles for his PhD. He's uh, currently working on uh, long-term dynamical uh, analysis of uh, the outer solar system and analysis of the K2 uh, mission to, uh, yeah, well, to advance uh, exoplanet demographics. Um, so I uh, would like to welcome John to uh, give his talk. Also, uh, please uh, turn off your uh, videos and your uh, microphone. And uh, if you have any questions, please try to keep them at the end of the talk. Unless it's very urgent, then please raise your hand in the uh, participants uh, box and then we'll uh, ask the question. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, I'm John Zink. I'm gonna be talking today about uh, Kepler and the K2 mission and exoplanet demographics and how we can use that data set to learn a lot of cool information. Okay, so briefly, just to outline what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to start by discussing the Kepler mission, how we can use transiting exoplanets to carry out demographic analysis and what we can learn from that. Uh, I'm then going to talk about how we're trying to use the follow-up mission, K2, to add to that sample and what new information we can gain from that. And finally, I'll conclude by just saying, some closing remarks on what we're hoping to accomplish by merging these two data sets for a larger demographic sample. <clears throat> okay, so the big question we really want to answer with exoplanet demographics is understanding how unique is our own solar system. And within this question, there's two smaller sub questions. Uh, the first is how do planets form? So we need to understand our origin, where these planets, what kind of materials needed to make them up, you know, spacing, period, uh, distances between planets and so forth is important. And we also need to understand something about the history of the system or how do planets or how do systems evolve over time? What dynamical aspects are important there? So those are our two big features I'm gonna talk about today. So I will start by going through some of the Kepler data findings. Um, so just to remind people who are unfamiliar, the Kepler mission essentially stared at one patch of the sky for four years. So this was a pretty small patch of the sky. It was about 0.25% of the total celestial sphere. So it's a really rather small fraction of the total sky. But the important thing is it stared continuously at that patch for four years, taking uh, data points about once every 30 minutes. And what that enabled us to do is to find a ton of these transiting planets. So just to remind people of transiting planets, the planet moves in front of the star, decreases the total brightness of the star or the observed brightness. And from that, we can understand something about the planet's radius and its period based on the periodicity of these transiting signals. So what did Kepler find? At the completion of its four years, it found nearly 3,000 planet candidates. So here I'm just plotting, you know, the planet candidates found by Kepler in red, uh, along with some of the solar system planets as well. So you can see it found a ton of planets in this parameter space. So this is radius versus period, but it didn't find a lot of these solar system analogs, which was really surprising. But demographics is all about taking this large sample and seeing what information can we back out from this really large sample. And there's a few things we wanna think about when we have this big data set now ready to go. We wanna understand, you know, what are the unique features in there that maybe indicate there's some kind of formation, underlying formation feature causing different separations. And we also wanna think about like systems, how are different systems playing in here? So a few things I just want to highlight briefly is you'll notice there's really not a lot of planets over here and there's not a lot of planets over here. Now, one of these is real 
in one of these seems to be some kind of bias with the sample. And this one over here is likely due to bias. So we're not finding a lot of planets over here because they're just at long periods and they have very small radiuses. So they produce really low signal to noise planets. Now that's great, I can tell you that. But what we really wanna do to do any kind of thorough demographics is understand that sample bias, have a good measure of the completeness. And really one of the workhorses for the Kepler mission that enabled all this great demographics work was the automation of the detection pipeline. So this is from front to back, no human invent intervention, taking this raw Kepler data and then determining whether there is a true planet candidate there or if this is either a false positive or there's just nothing in the light curve at all. And this is a really, really key step for demographics is having this full automation. Because if we have a fully automated pipeline like this, we can now run an injection recovery test and test the total completeness of the sample. And so the way that works is you take all of your transit data, right? You have all of these light curves. Most of them don't have a good signal in them and they're just relatively flat. And what you do is you inject these artificial transits into the data. And so now we know exactly what the radius is. We know exactly what the period is. And we can just run all this simulated data through the pipeline and see what we get out the other end. And the Kepler mission did so, and it was extremely fruitful. So I just want to focus really quickly on this plot on the left. So this is signal to noise. It's technically MES or multiple event statistics in Kepler speak, but it's just signal to noise. It's just a fancy way of saying signal to noise. And this is the fraction recovered here. And so you can see at low signal to noise, you know, most of these plants are not recovered as expected. But as you get higher and higher, whoop, sorry, you get higher and higher you recover a larger fraction of the injected planets. And again, this is, we all knew this coming in. We knew that signal, there's some bias over here, but what's really important is our ability to quantify this measure here and have a good model that we can fit to it. Because now we understand exactly what we're missing and we can simulate systems and run them through, you know, some kind of forward modeling algorithm. Uh, just to show highlight how that completeness affects the overall population, this is just the plot of the planet radius distribution, and the gray bars show the observed population, and the red bars show the correction once you account for this completeness. And you can see as you get into the smaller radius regime, the, complete, the completeness becomes much more important, and so it adds a larger fraction uh, to the population. But one thing we really noticed from Kepler is, again, a lot of these systems have relatively small planets at short periods, which is very unique when you look at our solar system. We're not seeing a lot of planets that look very similar or a lot of systems that look very similar to our own. This gets even further complicated when you think about the multi-planet systems. So in that 3,000 uh, planet candidate sample I talked about, 1,800 of those planets were in multi-planet systems. That means there was more than one planet in the light curve when it was searched. Uh, that yields about 500 systems in total. And so this is really interesting because this allows us to think about some of the dynamical effects that you know, affect these systems. Was there a large mutual inclination or not? Uh, we can think about eccentricity and how eccentricity growth is important. But one of the really unique findings was that when we looked at these multi-planet systems, what we found is most of them are pretty tightly packed. So I'm just highlighting here this Kepler 90 system. And on the, the right here, you can see how that compares to the solar system. So most of these planets are really, really tightly packed. And this is pretty common for a lot of the Kepler multi-planet systems, is this really tight packing. So it seems to indicate that they're not very dynamically evolved. There's not much uh, external perturbation kind of making these tightly packed systems difficult to form. Furthermore, there was a few other unique features found in these multi-planet systems. So when we looked at the, uh, the, the total uh, systems, we noticed that most of them were in uniform log spacing. 
So that means they are really, really nicely organized. Uh, and then when we looked at the radiuses of these multi-planet systems, most of them tended to have very similar radiuses. So the spread in radius for a given system was really, really small. And this led to what is known as the peas in a pod finding, right? Most of these systems are uniformly distributed in uh, rate, or sorry, in space, orbital spacing and very consistent radiuses. So they're very similar to peas in a pod in that sense. So this was one of the really interesting findings of Kepler and it really kind of opened our eyes to thinking about like, okay, well, these systems are far different than our own solar system. Uh, there must be maybe some different unique formation theories underlying causing this. But there was another issue that was found with the Kepler data. And that was when we looked at the Maltese and we compared them to the singles. So the systems where we only found one planet. There was a big disconnect. There's this clear separation, right? So you see this red here is the single planet systems and the black are the multi-planet systems. And there's this giant gap that we observed from the singles to the multis. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of things that can cause such a gap. Uh, transit probability is one, right? You need all the planets to be kind of edge on and that can definitely have an effect. But even when we account for that, we couldn't seem to fit a single Poisson distribution to this population. So that indicated that maybe there was, there was something going on here. And this became known as the Kepler dichotomy. And it lasted for about 10-ish years. People were like, okay, well, there's clearly something unique about the singles versus the Maltese. We can't seem to merge these two populations together. And there was a few theories that got thrown around. Um, <clears throat> one solution proposed was this idea that there were two populations uh, in the Kepler data. So we had a population of very thick disk um, planetary systems where they had a very high mutual inclination. And then there was this second population, which are really thin disk, a really low mutual inclination. <clears throat> and if you have these two unique populations, you know, you have a larger uh, parameter space, so it's easier to fit two Poisson distributions than it is to fit one. And you can definitely accomplish that goal uh, with this two population model. Uh, but this, this kind of leads to this weird, unique finding because in order for this to work out, you need to be a roughly 50-50 split. So you need half of the systems to be in this thick orientation <clears throat> and half of them to be in this thin orientation. And that seems like quite a large number of systems with a really thick, really dynamic, high dynamically heated uh, orientation. So maybe that's not the, the true solution. So one thing I did is I went back and I looked at the, the Kepler data set and the Kepler pipeline itself and I thought, okay, there's one thing that we're not really accounting for here is we're accounting for all the sample biases or most of the sample biases, we're accounting for all the probabilities of transiting, uh, mutual inclination can all be accounted for. <clears throat> but the one thing that wasn't really considered was, is the probability of, or is the, is the detection efficiency for the first planet the same as the second? And what I mean by that is, is it just as easy for us to find a one planet system as it is for us to find a two planet system, you know, accounting for all of the transit probabilities and such? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is the way the pipeline works. So let's imagine we have this, this data set here. The way that the pipeline goes through is it looks for the largest signal to noise transit first. Voila, found so. What it then does is it then masks off three times the transit duration to then search the data again to look for another planet. So you can imagine in this like special case here where you have a, a transit really close by, you completely mask off that second transit uh, bef before you go searching again. Um, so this is obviously a very extreme case, but something to remember is it doesn't necessarily have to um, remove all of the transient data points. It just has to remove enough 
to push it below the signal to, the uh, signal to noise detection threshold. So really this has a big effect. And what we, we, we did is we went back and looked at all the injection data. And remember I said that injection data or those injections were made on every light clear curve, even the ones that already had planets in them. And what we found is that when these injections were made, 69 of the known planet candidates were actually lost just because an injection was made. So that means there was a higher signal to noise injection made causing some kind of masking issue that made it less likely for these secondary planets to be detected. So using this data, we can actually quantify this, you know, second completeness map. <clears throat> and that's what I'm showing here. So again, the blue is what was found for Kepler. What this red guy is now showing is the completeness for the second planet or greater. So essentially the completeness for multi-planet systems. And you'll notice that it's a little bit lower than the blue guy, right? So the completeness for multi-planet systems is lower. And that becomes even more important at these long, large periods, right? Where there's fewer transits. So this shadowing effect has a bigger impact. Um, now you may be looking here, like most of the planets are in this range here. So is this, is this a significant fraction? Should we be worried about this when we think about demographics? And I would say, yes, I think it's super important. And here's why. So this is just taking those two graphs and subtracting them. This is the detection difference between the first and the second greater planet. And all previous studies had assumed this was essentially zero. This is the same for the first, second, third, fourth planet, and so forth. But what we're showing is that when you account for this, this detection uh, completeness actually is rather significant near the threshold. So for these planets here, it almost gets up to about 18% difference. So that's a, a rather dramatic decrease in detection efficiency. Um, over here at the longer periods, it gets up to you know like 35% difference. So it's very, very significant near the threshold. It obviously drops down to higher signal to noise. Um, but one thing to really keep in mind is that about 50% of the total uh, candidates found by Kepler have a signal to noise less than about 18. So they're mostly in this range. So this has a really large impact because this is where most of the planets we're finding are. And so if we're getting this completeness wrong, then we're getting the extrapolation or the underlying population wrong as well. We're undercounting in some sense. So with this new completeness correction in hand, we can then go back to our forward model, plug this guy in, run some underlying population. And what do we find? Voila, we do not, we no longer need two Poisson distributions to describe this strange dichotomy. This was done with a single Poisson distribution, the average number of planets of about 5.86, mutual inclination relatively low, about 1.5 degrees. Uh, and you can see that our model is now fitting the observed data really well. We don't need this second population. Now, with that said, I will put this caveat, just because we don't need it, doesn't mean it's not there. One of the big takeaways I think from this that we're showing is that yes, most of the systems are in this flat orientation, but there probably is likely some, some much smaller fraction of systems that are in this thick orientation with larger mutual inclination. Uh, but the problem is with transits, we can really only get a good sense of these guys here. Uh, it's, it's more difficult for us to understand these thick disk systems or these wider mutual inclination systems. So if we want to have a good handle on that and really probe uh, the mutual, the larger mutual inclination systems, what we need to do is we need to compare our transiting data with RV follow-up. I think that's super important moving forward with uh, this idea of understanding the overall dynamical aspects of these systems. So with the transiting data, it's great. It gives us a good handle on the flat systems, but with the radial velocity, we can actually find planets that are not transiting. And so what we can do is we can go back and look at these systems where we already have one planet 
and then do some RV follow-up to see if there is a second planet with a higher mutual inclination that we're just not finding there. Uh, furthermore, there's some really exciting things that are uh, really exciting instruments coming online in the near future that are going to make this even more easy. Uh, with the Keck Planet Finder coming on in early 2022, and the new id, which is essentially coming online immediately, uh, these two high precision RV instruments are really going to enable us to do these finer dynamical uh, measurements. And one thing I'm personally really excited about is thinking about these peas in a pod systems. So I mentioned earlier that you can see here this plot is just showing the different stars, you know, the orbital separation and the radius of the planets. So this is just a selection of Kepler multi-planet systems. And you'll see, you know, most of them, the radiuses are pretty similar and the spacing is pretty even. But you'll notice that in a couple of them, right, there's some very large orbital gaps. And I'm just highlighting that with these red bars now. And what that could possibly be, something that I'm really excited about following up is maybe there is another planet hidden in that gap, but it's just not transiting. It's just off a little bit. And if we go back and look at these systems with these like high uh, precision RV instruments that are coming online soon, we can maybe detect planets in these gaps. And that'll give us some, understand, some better understanding of what the mutual inclination of these systems are. And one thing I really want to highlight that is really important is mutual inclination is directly linked to our understanding of multiplicity. So if our mutual inclination goes up, uh, then the average number of planets goes up as well, right? Because that means we're finding fewer planets. So our, our current population is underestimating the number of actual planets. Now, if our mutual inclination goes down and we find that systems are flatter than we think, uh, then our multiplicity measurements are either currently correct or they're actually overestimating a little bit. So it's really, it's really important that we get a good handle on mutual inclination and how it affects our understanding of uh, multiplicity in these systems. So kind of changing gears a little bit, uh, one thing that I think is really important for multiplicity is it really informs our understanding of, you know, Earth analogs or Eta Earth. So one of the key mission goals for Kepler was to make a measurement of Eta Earth or the probability of finding an Earth analog. And there's been several studies that have made attempts at it. So uh, this plot here is just showing Gamma Earth, which is a little bit different than Eta Earth, Eta Earth being the probability of an Earth analog. Gamma Earth is the density of Earth analogs. So a lot of people in the community like to talk about Gamma Earth because it takes out all the um, assumptions about habitability. You know, you don't have to integrate over some radius or period space. Everyone should have roughly the same uh, Gamma Earth value. But what you'll know, notice by this, this plot here, just showing all the different values, there's still quite a significant spread in our understanding of what Gamma Earth is. Uh, and this, this Bryson one is the most, the most recent. It came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So we're starting to kind of converge on our gamma Earth value. But because Kepler was cut short uh, at the four-year mark, we really have to extrapolate into the Earth parameter space. And that, that's difficult. And despite everyone using roughly the same data set, we're all getting very different answers. Uh, you'll notice my value is a little bit larger because I have this whole multiplicity correction. So, you know, if we're missing more planets, that means our uh, Eta Earth value is going to be a little bit larger. Um, but yeah, there's still quite a large spread. And a lot of it has to do with either methodology, modeling, or assumptions about things like mutual inclination. These are all super important to our understanding of this Eta Earth or Gamma Earth calculation. Um, but maybe Kepler is not the end all be all. Kepler is really just only staring at one patch of the sky, right? I mentioned this earlier that Kepler is only staring at 0.25% of the total celestial sphere. So maybe that's not really a great way to think about this. Is this really informing us about the demographics of the total galaxy? Or is this really just informing us about the demographics of this one patch of the sky? It might be good, but we just don't know unless we have other data. 
another way to really think about this is if we wanted to understand how salty is the ocean, right? Uh, we could all, you know, somehow get to the ocean. I know people are in different parts of the, the world right now, so this is easier for some than others. But you get to an ocean, you scoop out a bucket, right? So for me, I'm near Los Angeles, so I can drive down to the beach, grab out a bucket of water. You know, if I wanted to be really scientific, I'd get in a boat, go out a mile or two, grab out a bucket of water, and then test it to see what is the salt content of the ocean. Uh, and you can see, I would get a really good baseline estimate of what the salt content is. But you can see, looking at the globe, that is not representative of the total salt in the ocean, right? There's lots of different ranges, different values. And what you would really want to do to get a better understanding of the salt content of the ocean is you would go around and take lots of different samples around the world. Then you'd get a better average, you'd see what the distribution is, and you can see how it fluctuates in different regions, right? So I like to think of this as an analog for the Kepler mission. The Kepler mission is our local understanding, right? We're looking at one small patch of the sky. It's going to give us a great baseline measurement, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the global average. So the one of the beautiful things that happened, or I shouldn't say this is great, but one of the the reasons the Kepler mission failed is that, uh, or came to cease to, to continue collecting data for, on that one field is that two of the reaction wheels actually broke on the telescope. And what that did is it then caused solar radiation to drift the telescope a little bit over time. So this gave birth to the K2 mission. And what they did for the K2 mission is they said, okay, we can look at the ecliptic because the ecliptic has the minimum amount of solar radiation. So this little push from the sun is going to be minimized when we look at these patches across the ecliptic. So this was kind of a, a feature that, you know, they just got this nice ecliptic data uh, because of this, this problem with the instrumentation. But it really enables us to do a lot of great new science because with the K2 data, we can look at how demographics change as a function of galactic latitude, stellar age, stellar metallicity, and stellar mass, because the, the Kepler sample is relatively focused on a lot of FGK stars uh, with a really tight uh, distribution on solar metallicity. So the K2 mission is really the future for demographics as of right now. Uh, taking this one step further, this is now an edge-on view of the two mission, uh, two mission footprints. And you can see Kepler is mostly focused on this thin disk region, the galactic substructure. Whereas K2 looks at all different types of regions in the galactic substructure. And this could be important, right? We might want to look at this thick disk region and see how planet occurrence changes as we look from the thin disk to the thick disk. We have some early evidence indicating that alpha abundance, which is greater in the thick disk, is important for planet formation, but we need more data. And the Kepler mission is really, or the K2 mission is really gonna enable us to do that. And finally, just looking at the overall parameter state, space of these two missions, the stellar parameter space, you can see that K2 spans a much larger parameter space. So we can really kind of change this, this function of uh, stellar mass and see how it affects planet exoplanet and demographics. The same goes for metallicity, right? A much wider distribution of metallicity so we think that metallicity is very much linked to planet formation, but being able to, you know, parse out these different features is going to be super important for understanding, you know, the underlying formation mechanisms of these planets. Okay, so why hasn't this been done? The Kepler, the K2 data has been out for a few years now. Uh, everyone's had a whack at it. Why can't we start doing demographics? Here's the problem. I mentioned that K2 has this solar radiation issue, right? Without its, its third gyro, it can no longer keep stable on one field for a very, very distant, a uh, very, very long period of time. And so every six hours, it needs to be uh, kind of recalibrated. So it has a six hour thruster boost that it gets hit with. And upon doing that, when you look at the light curves, you'll notice most of the light curves have these nice six hour like dips in it that look like transits, but they're really not. They're just, you know, the actual instrument just moving just a little bit, you know, 
gets spread across a pixel or two. So you see some, some dips in the light curves. So there's a bunch of systematics that make K2 really difficult to work with. Uh, and up until this point, all known K2 plants have been identi identified through some form of visual inspection. So someone has had to go through the data and say like, okay, this is definitely a planet. This is not a planet. Because both of these are being triggered by the, the BLS or the algorithm that looks for transits. So our goal was to look into this and see if we could, we could somehow make K2 suitable for demographics. So this is work with uh, Jesse Christensen, Kevin Hardery-Allman, myself, and a bunch of other great scientists that are helping along the way. And we're really trying to set up K2 to be the next demographic mission, right? We have all the data, the data's there. We just have to build the framework that enables us to be able to do great science with it. And so what do we need to make K2 uh, work for demographics? We really need four basic ingredients. We need a stellar sample with corresponding parameter measurements. We need a catalog of planets. We need measurements of false negative rate and the false positive rate of that catalog of planets. Once we have all four of these ingredients, we're good to go. We're ready to bake. So step one, we need a stellar sample. So this is work with uh, Kevin Hardery Allman and Essentially, what he did is he took all of the K2 uh, photometric data from SDSS, 2MASS, and Gaia, and used Gaia distances. And for about 10% of that data, we have good high-res LAMOS spectra. So we can get really good parameters for about 10% of our total uh, stellar sample. Now, what about the rest of the 90%? How do we get good stellar uh, parameters for that? And the way we did that, is we use this subset, this 10% subset, and we ran it through a random forest classifier. So this is a machine learning technique where you train all the photometric data you have for this 10% uh, on the, the LAMOS spectral where you have good measurements. And then you can then run this algorithm on the larger subset of data to back out stellar measurements. So, now on our full catalog, we have good stellar radii, good spectral type measurements, effective temperature, surface gravity, metallicity, and mass. So on our whole set of 200,000 targets, we now have good measurements of all of these features using this machine algorithm uh, aspect. So something we kind of got for free, it's some low hanging fruit here that we didn't really expect was by improving the stellar radius measurements for these K2 targets, we also improved the planar radius measurements for the K2 target that had already been known. So remember, K2 data has been out for a while. People have gone through and looked through it by eye and backed out a bunch of interesting planet candidates. So there's already a bunch of planet candidates known. And by just making this improvement in the uh, stellar radius, you can see that we made a pretty significant impact on the radius distribution of K2 planets. So the dotted line shows you what the distribution looked like before. And the solid line shows you now what the distribution looks like with this uh, improved stellar radius measurements. And you'll notice there's this giant kind of divot here around two Earth radii. And this is a really important feature because this was a, a feature that was noticed in the Kepler data and it's known as the radius valley. Um, but it hadn't been identified in K2 yet. So by finding it in K2 data, it's really important because it indicates that this truly is a population feature and there must be some kind of underlying formation effect causing this separation here uh, in the radius space, separating the sub-Neptunes from the super Earths. So some kind of formation mechanism really causing a big divot here. And by finding K2, we're just validating it and you know, saying like, okay, it's clearly not a systematic effect. We're finding it in various different parts of the galaxy. Okay, so we had our stellar sample. We have good parameter measurements now. Our next part is our catalog of planets. So this is uh, some work I've been kind of heading up and really what we needed to do is we needed to build an automated pipeline to detect K2 planets. Kepler had the RoboVetter, and we used a lot of the techniques used from the RoboVetter, but we added on a few new features that were specific for K2 
that enabled us to fully automate. So remember at the beginning, I talked about automation is key for us to be able to test our sample and understand the underlying biases. And so what I did is I built this uh, framework, this pipeline with the Eddie Vetter uh, aspect attached on the end that tells us whether it's a planet candidate or not. Uh, it's based on Pearl Jam. If you're not a Pearl Jam fan, don't worry about it. If you are, hopefully it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, we built this and it seems to work. We tested it out on one of the campaigns, so campaign five, one of the fields of K2, and we were able to recover 75 planets without any human intervention. We found seven multi-planet systems and eight previously undetected planets were found by just running our automated pipeline through. Overall, we were able to recover about 51% of the previously known candidates. So that fraction always seems really surprisingly low for a lot of people. They're like, all right, well, you only got 51%. But remember, K2 data is really messy. And our goal here is not necessarily to find every single planet that's in the data. Our goal is to find a sample that we have a really good understanding of the underlying biases that you know, affect this sample. And so we were happy with these numbers. Okay, so we have our stellar sample, catalog of planets on our, can our pilot study on C5. Now we need our measurements of false negative rate and false positive rate. Uh, so again, coming back to our, our pilot study, we can then run the injection recovery test because our pipeline is fully automated and we can get good measurements of the sample completeness. So plotted here is another one of those, you know, MES versus recovery fraction plots. And I want you to focus on this dark blue line. That's the K2 vetted completeness and the, the darker orange line here, and that's the Kepler completeness. So you can see we're not nearly as complete as Kepler, even at high signal to noise, but we are completely okay with that. That's fine by us because we now have a good measure of this completeness. And that's really the important part here. Uh, on the right here, I'm just showing our reliability. We're very reliable for you know, high signal to noise stuff, less reliable in these regions over here. I don't want to get too into how we measure reliability, but essentially it enables us to say that our, our sample is about 94% reliable in total, which is comparable to the 96% reliable, 96 reliability of Kepler. So there's not a lot of false positives in our data, essentially. OK, so we now have all four steps, all four ingredients. We just have to mix and bake. So before I get into the results of what we found with our C5 sample, I just want to point out that these are truly independent samples, right? Kepler's way over here. Campaign 5 is way over here. This is an independent transit demographic sample. Uh, furthermore, C5 probes a much different region of the uh, galactic substructure, so very independent. OK, so when we compare these two samples, our K2C5 sample with the Kepler sample, You'll see that most of the stellar radiuses are similar, temperature is relatively similar, and mass is somewhat similar for these two samples, right? The one big thing that's different is the metallicity. So you'll notice in our, our sample of K2, we have a slightly lower metallicity than the Kepler sample. And so naively, before we went into this, we thought, okay, just based on this fact alone, we might expect that you know, this, this one field in K2 might have a slightly lower planet occurrence because we think metallicity is linked to planet formation. And so if this sample is a lower stellar metallicity, there's probably gonna be fewer planets. And what we found was just that. So here's kind of our results, our occurrence results from this, this one uh, sample. In the blue, this is the, po the posterior values for our FGK dwarf occurrence values. So blue is Kepler. Uh, the sharpness of this point uh, peak just indicates how precise our value is. So remember, we have about 3,000 planets here. We have about 75 planets here. So you can see Kepler is much more precise than K2 is. But we're still seeing a, about a two sigma deficit in a planet occurrence here in this green sample. Um, there's a few takeaways here. So one thing that you can take away by looking at these two values is that, okay, it appears K2 has this deficit. So maybe 
planet formation is linked to uh, metallicity for even these small planets that were really probing this uh, region, regime. But another thing you'll notice is there, there is rather significant overlap between these two planet occurrence values. And so you might also say, well, okay, this is maybe good news too, because this is early evidence that maybe the Kepler field is rather representative. It's not wildly different. We're not finding some value that's you know, 20 sigma different than what was found with Kepler. So maybe, maybe a lot of the takeaways we learned from Kepler can be applied to the broader uh, galaxy. But definitely, there is more work to be done here. And I can now say, you know, that was just all done with one, one of the campaigns. We now have processed all 18 K2 campaigns. So we now, instead, only have 75 planets. We now have 730 planets in this K2 sample. So this is a much, much larger, more significant uh, planet sample. 200 of these are brand new planet candidates that we found just by running our automated pipeline through all the K2 data. Uh, this is work that's in prep. We are going to release this sample with all of our measurements of completeness, reliability, <clears throat> basically all the light curves as well. So really we're hoping that the community of exoplanet uh, demographics really accepts this and starts migrating this into all their codes and using this additional data set uh, along with the Kepler data set to you know, learn more about the planet demographics throughout the galaxy rather than just through this one field. So as promised, I wanted to talk about some of the synergy or some of the exciting low hanging fruit I think we're gonna be able to kind of get once we combine these two data sets. And so one of the things I'm really excited about is thinking about this radius valley and the sub-Neptune desert. So these are two real population features. There's a deficit in planets here and here. These are, you know, completeness corrected. So this is not a completeness issue here or here. And you'll see this is a function of flux and stellar radius. And so why are these two deficits occurring? That's really an open question still. There's a few theories. Um, one of the theories for this radius valley is that, you know, nature just creates planets ignoring this gap. Like there's no reason that it creates this bimodal distribution. It has some power law function that it applies. But planets that lie in this gap upon formation uh, are unable to retain their large envelopes and then get pushed down into this rocky regime down here. So there's a few mechanisms for doing that. Uh, and also the planets up here are large enough that they can retain their envelopes. So they kind of just stay where they are. But if you, if you think about how photo, photo evaporation can play into this, it can actually remove these large atmospheres and push these planets down into the lower radius bin and create a population down here, really separating out these two populations either through photo evaporation or potentially core powered mass loss is another theory. Uh, the same idea can be applied over here to the sub-Neptune desert, right? You have some planets that form here, but photo evaporation also could potentially remove their envelopes, pushing them into this more rocky regime. Now, these are great theories uh, and definitely stuff we wanna test. There's some observable things that we can look at. And so let's think about how stellar mass plays into this. So this really is marginalized over all stellar masses. But if we look at stellar mass as a function uh, and we look at the X-ray luminosity fraction up here. So as you go down in stellar mass closer to the m dwarfs, your fraction of X-ray luminosity goes up. So what that means is that you're having a larger photo evaporation effect if you have a smaller mass star, all other things held constant. And so what we're hoping to do now with our, our K2 data is really test this theory. And so what we expect is as we you know, separate this out into smaller and smaller mass regimes, uh, what we're hoping to find is that this limit moves this way and this radius moves that way. That would be indication that photo evaporation really is the, the underlying formation effect here. And the reason K2 is ripe to, to create this very study is because it has a much wider 
uh, parameter space of stellar mass, right? It probes a much larger portion of these low mass stars. So we can actually start to bin this out and see if we can recover this uh, expected trend. Uh, just to highlight that we can actually do this with K2 data. So this is our, our K2 sample. It's our K2 relative occurrence. You can see we really cover the parameter space of the radius valley and the sub-Neptune desert. So we already see they're there. What we have to test now is whether they move or not as a function of stellar mass. And that's something we're really excited to do now that we have this sample ready to go. It's something that we're hoping to have results in the very near future on. Um, so with that, I will just conclude by reminding everyone we talked about. So we want to answer two questions. How do planets form? And really, we're hoping to test that in the really near future with the K2 sample and testing out these observable features with uh, photo evaporation or poor power mass loss and see if we can you know, back them out with the K2 data. That's something we're hoping to find. And then we also talked about the uh, how orbits evolve or dynamical history of systems. And I really want to test that in the very near future with RV follow-up and these high precision instruments that are coming online in the near future. And hopefully with these two uh, data sets ready, we can really get a better understanding of, you know, how unique is our solar system in the galaxy? I think that's one of the grand questions we want to answer. So I will leave up my conclusion slides, just highlighting a few things. Uh, Kepler, we talked about the Kepler dichotomy and how we can explain it, the Kepler dichotomy with a single underlying Poisson distribution now. We don't need this second uh, distribution. And also with K2, some of our early evidence showing that stellar metallicity does have an effect on the occurrence of small planets. So we already had an idea that this was important for large uh, gaseous planets, but we're now seeming to find that metallicity is also super important for small planets as well. These sub-Neptunes and super-Earths also appear to have some link to metallicity. Again, more data to come in the near future with that. And uh, we're really excited to, to really test out these, these ideas. So uh, with that, I will thank you guys and take any questions. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, John. Um, it looks like we have a question from Caitlin. Hi, uh, John, thanks for the very interesting talk. I have a, a couple of questions. I'll just start with one and then let other people get a, get a chance. Um, I'm wondering if you can say anything about the properties of the planets that are coming up with, uh, I guess, Eddie Vedder, but have not been found previously. You know, are there any trends that you can identify? Maybe you haven't done the full analysis on the sample. Maybe you only know for the one field. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, no, we have not done the full analysis. Uh, there's definitely a few exciting planets that were really some like one-offs we're kind of excited about. Uh, generally, what we're finding with these, these 200 new planets, they're relatively low signal to noise, right? So when people went through by eyeball, they were looking for the easy stuff, picking off the, the, the easy fruit. So what we're finding is the stuff that's lower in signal to noise. So it's a lot, a lot more smaller planets. Uh, and usually has a little bit longer periods. Uh, I can't really say anything about the trends. I do know there's a few interesting planets that have surprisingly low uh, metallicity on their host star, which we're really excited about. But other than that, I can't really say anything about the trends currently. Okay, and, and what about the false positive rates for the new candidates, the things that are new to your sample versus the recovered ones? Yeah, so our, our false positive rate is about 94%, uh, it, which is comparable to 96 from Kepler. Uh, I'm not, I don't wanna, I don't know if you are familiar with how we test reliability or like our false positives. We do this whole like invert the light curves, run it through again. Hopefully we find nothing, we find a few. So that tells us something about the reliability of our sample. But yeah, it should be a really high reliability sample. We, we should be, I don't want to say we're comparable with Kepler, but we're pretty close to the, the Kepler reliability. And just to, to clarify, one thing I wasn't sure about, the is there a difference in the measurement you make for the recovered planets versus the new candidates? Or have you not separated the sample that way? 
the recovered planets versus the new. So you have 730 planets, I guess 530 of which, for example, were already known. Yeah. And then you have 200 new ones, which you just said were maybe lower to signal to noise on average. If you run those through your reliability detector, do you get the same false positive expectation value for both samples? Yeah, so it is gonna be a little bit lower. You're, you're absolutely right. Because I said that it's lower signal to noise. Here, I'll show you our reliability map again, just to highlight that. So, uh, you know, most of the stuff that had already been found is in this regime. We're, we're finding more stuff that's in this regime. So it is slightly lower reliability. You're, you're absolutely right in that sense. Yeah. And the ones that you're missing, do you know where those would live in your reliability space? You know, they're pretty spread uh, uniformly uh, about it. You're talking about like the, why we're only recovering 50% rather than like closer to 90 or 100%. Sure, yeah. yeah. But they're pretty uniform and spread. Um, there's a lot of reasons that K2 is more difficult when it comes to finding planets, even the high signal to noise ones. Um, one of the issues the high signal to noise planets have is we have a lot of detrending that goes into it that tries to eliminate, um, you know, just weird systematics. And if you have a really deep transit, it actually looks like red noise and the detrender will actually just dive right in and remove the transit completely. So it's relatively uniform. As far I, as yeah, I, I guess the reason I'm asking is I'm, I'm wondering about any potential biases that are introduced into the new sample based on, you know, possible types of systems that the automated pipeline is less good at recovering than the human eye or vice versa, the things that the human eye is, you know, missing versus your, your pipeline. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't really thought about that. So when I, I should clarify that 700 value I point out, that's, this is fully automated. Like these are all automated detections. There's, you know, some of them we found that already had been found before, you know, 200 of them hadn't been found before, but then there's a bunch more missing as well too. Right. So in theory, it should all be tied in there together because it's all ran through the same pipeline in theory. But yeah, I don't know off the top of my head like what, what biases like are unique to the better versus like humans and stuff like that. Yeah, just in terms of doing an interpretation of the demographics, right? It would be good to know if there's a, you know, oh, you're really good at low metallicity and people are bad at it or vice versa. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Definitely something we should look into. I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. All right, uh, we have a question from Eugene. Yeah, hi, John. Uh, well, I was wondering what your sensitivity is to ultra short period planets, those with periods less than a day. Yeah, uh, not great. <laughs> so we actually make a hard cut at 0.5 days. So anything below 0.5 days, we are not getting at all. Like we, we make a really hard cut there just because uh, the systematics get really bad below 0.5 days. We did everything we could to try to, to reduce that limit, but it ended up at the end of the day, it was just too hard to, to maintain uh, our full automation uh, and going below that. So yeah, we do get down to 0.5. Uh, we find a bunch of stuff down there. It's, it's pretty good because you, know, you obviously get a lot more transits when you're at that low period. Um, but yeah, we're not getting anything below 0.5. I don't know if that's helpful, hopefully. No, that, that's interesting. Uh, I'm wondering if you've compared it to, uh, there was a study done by Sanchez Ojeda, I think, for these uh, down to 10 hour periods. I think yeah. they might've gone even lower, but you can do a direct comparison between your occurrence rates and their occurrence rates. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, again, we make a hard cut at 0.5, so. I think, I thought that one went, yeah, 10 days, I guess, a little bit less than 0.5. So yeah, it's a good point. I don't know off the top of my head though. We definitely should look into that more. Any evaporating planets? Uh, you know, our vetter is so strong. Anything weird, it just throws out. So I think anything that looked like an evaporating planet, it would probably just completely dismiss because it has to be really strong to get rid of all the systematics. But okay, thanks, thanks. All right, question from Everett. Well, really excellent talk. Uh, thanks for the, describing the big economy very clearly. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with, the, with these statistics, are these of planet candidates? And I was wondering like what, how that would differ from 
something like I think the Kepler uh, California Kepler survey looks at like confirmed ones with radio velocities and things. I was wondering if you could kind of just compare those two methods. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, these are all planet candidates. Um, the California Kepler survey does do follow up on uh, Kepler planet candidates. Sometimes they are able to confirm them with RV and sometimes they're not. Most of the time what they're trying to do is give better spectral properties. So they're trying to improve their stellar sample uh, in that sense. So there's, there is some issues. Um, people have talked about, okay, maybe we shouldn't be doing de demographics with candidates. We should be doing it with confirmed planets. The problem there is you actually introduce a whole nother level of bias once you start thinking about confirmed planets, right? Because with confirmed planets, you're only really getting a sample down to a certain magnitude limit. And then it gets more difficult from there on. And also there's all these like issues with the window function, right? You need lots of baseline to get good planets. Um, so yeah, usually when we talk about demographics, we think about candidates because it's, it's kind of a more pure way, right? We have our understanding of the completeness. We have our understanding of the reliability. And so we're good to go there. Once you kind of take it up to the next level, it gets a little more tricky, so yeah. And then uh, just clarify, is that reliability measuring the ones that, how, how likely they're to be confirmed? Yeah, so the reliability should tell you something about uh, its likelihood to be, likelihood of being real, not necessarily likelihood of being confirmed because they could be at very, very uh, high magnitudes, right? So it doesn't mean they're like really achievable. The way the reliability works, just because it seems like people are interested, um, is you take your, your light curves, right? You have all your data and you have, some of them have transits in it. <clears throat> some of them have transits you found, some of them have transits you have not found. And so the way to eliminate all transits is you just flip them upside down. So now all your transits are going up. You really shouldn't have anything going down that's astrophysical. And then you rerun it through the data set or rerun it through the pipeline and you hope that you get zero, you get like nothing, like nothing makes it through. And so a few things always do make it through. And those are clearly systematics that are, that are making it through. And that gives you some indication of, all right, in this parameter space, we're finding you know, X amount of false positives. So that gives you some understanding of how reliable is that region of parameter space. Thank you very much. All right, any final questions for John? If not, then I would like to invite everyone to unmute and thank John for an excellent talk. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Great. Thank you.